All right, you're very welcome back to Wednesday's Off the Ball. I'm delighted to be joined on the line from Tokyo by rugby referee Joy Neville. Evening, Joy. Hey, Nathan, how are you? Or to give you your official title now, World Rugby Referee of the Year and Rehab Sports Person of the Year. It's pretty lofty heights. <laughs> you're the first person to say that, and I hope you're the last. I cringe <laughs> when I hear that, but yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty spectacular to be honest. It's, it's um, yeah, it's a bit um, I, yeah. I, I don't really, I don't necessarily like the titles, but it's 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 cool. That's <laughs> oh, very cool. And to get a rehab sports award and to be the sports person of the year and and honoured by people around the country, it only happened last weekend. Was it a surprise? Uh, no, no. To be honest, it wasn't. I um, rehab had contacted me and and just said that I was nominated, so I elected at that. And uh, and literally in the same call, the same conversation, they said, "And you're actually being chosen as a sports person." And I was I was pretty shocked. Um, so the, the girls, uh, the friends, always flag me now. They're like, "Geez, you're you're on social media again." And I was like, "Lads, you know, you get an award for getting an award, you know." <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, I'm 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 obviously honoured, extremely honoured, and. Uh, you know, in in the best possible sense, quite embarrassed um, because due to the fact that the amount of the, the people who've received have been recipients of of the of the rehab rewards to date, like they're just spectacular, inspirational people, and what they've what they're trying to achieve um, compared to, I suppose, what I'm trying to achieve personally and and overall. But um, look, I'll, I'll take it, and and I'm obviously delighted to to receive um, the the award. It caps off a pretty incredible 12 months for you. First woman to referee in the Pro 14, first woman to referee in the Challenge Cup. And those type of awards are given for people who are inspirational. Does that something that weighs on your shoulders or it's something you really embrace that you go out there? Yes, I am representing young women who want to go on and be referees in what's generally a male dominated sport. Or is it just something you're thinking about yourself and this all comes with it? Look, I mean, if if this benefits others and opens up, like obviously, I'd like to open up further opportunities for other f- referees coming through, female referees coming through. But, um, um, you know, do I see myself as a trailblazer? No, I don't. I mean, I'm I'm there to do a job, and um, you know, I am very conscious of the minority group that probably are waiting for me to make mistakes and you know prove uh, that you know it's no place for a woman to be refereeing in the male professional game and when i say minority i'm talking about very few people mm. um but i think that's that's my ammunition um and that's my drive and if it, i suppose it 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 motivates me to be as prepared as possible in order to in order to perform um and yeah it's it's a great drive to have and um and thankfully i'm yeah i'm enjoying what i'm doing and um, thankfully, I'm 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 doing um, the job to, to to the standard necessary. It's all been a bit of a whirlwind. It's only five years since you were winning a Grand Slam as a player with Ireland, and now to be thinking about well, can I go and referee Grand Six Nations games for women and for men, or be on the sideline, whatever it is? It's been a meteoric rise, and it, it seems as though it's such a brilliant example to rugby players who retire and are looking for what's next, that you can go get down this route and you can move up the ranks quite quickly. But also for maybe young people who are playing rugby at 20, 21, who aren't going to get to that highest level and are wondering how they can stay involved in the game. That actually, if you go, you dedicate yourself to refereeing, where there are opportunities, because it's not the type of profession that I'd say they're overrun with numbers with, that actually, yeah, you can move up the ranks. You can get a lot of opportunities for yourself. Absolutely. There's massive opportunities. And I think there's a massive stigma when it comes to refereeing. Um, and I certainly was of the view that, you know, like I was when I was approached about refereeing, I had no more interest. And part of the reason was because who wants to be a referee when you're sh- there's no winner? And that's the perception that there is no winner where, in fact, there is. Um, and, you know, the aim of the game is to go out there, do a job. Um, you know, I, I certainly think of the players as, as a past player and I try to give the best platform as possible and remain as anonymous as possible. Um, while that's not always the case, we're human in the end of the day and mistakes will be had. But um, certainly there's 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 so many opportunities and particularly for past players, I think, um, you know, there's massive opportunities and openings for them, as certainly in my case. And I know speaking of Frank Murphy and Johnny Lacey and Andy Brace, they've all played before becoming uh, referees, that you have that extra benefit and insight and understanding to what the players are trying to achieve. And I certainly feel that um, it gives you a step ahead, if anything. 
you often see in soccer in particular, and it causes a controversy for a couple of days, where a referee might give a penalty or might give an advantage and the player goes on to score a goal and he gives a little fist pump or something and then you're accused of bias and all sorts. Whereas actually they're probably just celebrating making that right decision. And what you talk about there of the satisfaction of being a referee and doing a good job, how does that compare to when you were playing and when you were winning games for Ireland? Is it a very different emotion on full-time? Like, do you, do you get a real sense of satisfaction if you make all the right decisions when you're in the dressing room afterwards? It's so different, but yes, it's quite similar. But, you know, when you're playing, you're playing with a team. You're not alone. You make a mistake, your buddy beside you will pick you, pick you up. You'll get, you'll have the consequences afterwards <laughs> in 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 um, on, in analysis and and selection. But at least you have fourteen others around and and bench behind you and supporting you and uh, reassuring you. But as as a referee, you're in the middle. You make one mistake, all eyes are on you. Yeah, you certainly grow thick skin. Um, but as far as personal challenge, it is a lot, a lot, like extremely challenging. And particularly with the main challenge for me and I know for others would be the man management, um, you know, change, trying to change player behavior, keeping the players on your side. You know, the man management is massive. But there's certainly that um, sense of achievement going off at pitch when both teams, winners and losers, come up to you and say, geez, you, you were brilliant. Thanks very much. And. That obviously doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, it's you know it's quite special. Yeah, and on the other side, I guess one of the differences is when you do make a mistake, that as a player, there's an opportunity to go out and redeem yourself and play better the next time. Whereas when you're a referee and you make a mistake, it can have long-lasting impacts on, on other people, on the 30 players on the pitch who are 15 who are devastated by your decision, and you go back in, you realise, actually, maybe I did make a mistake here. How, how do you deal with that side of it? If you do look back and you realise, maybe I did get that wrong... Who do you turn to? How do you keep yourself going so that actually you don't doubt yourself? Because I guess self-confidence is a huge thing for referees. Absolutely. There's an expectation of excellence when it comes to referees and always getting the, the right, um, correct decision. But again, it's, it's just not the case. It's just not possible for any referee. And for the first uh, nine months of refereeing, I, I absolutely detested it. And I was about to give up. And my wife just convinced me to stick at it. She, you know, she said there was something there. And actually, ex-international referee Helen O'Reilly, she, she was, it was Helen who convinced Simona to keep to, for me to stick at it. But And part of the reason why I, I really didn't like it is because... I played 70 times. I had 70 different referees refereeing me at international level and I expected it to be that good from the very beginning, which is not going to be the case. Mistakes are going to happen. And, you know, I think we as humans, we need to embrace mistakes in new environments because you learn from the mistakes and understand why they happen in order for them not to happen again or minimize the chances of them happening again or even understanding and learning how to react differently or better. Um but yeah, look, it's I think it's all part and parcel of 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 the job, um, and it's about learning from those moments and trying to improve upon them. You're moving more and more into refereeing men's games. Is there a difference in the reaction to men over women when a mistake is made? Have you noticed any difference? No, I haven't actually. Uh, what I have noticed in, in the men's and women's game is when you referee the women, they're a lot more honest. <laughs> You'll find uh, in restarting the scrums and stuff, they play the scrum to restart the game, whereas in the men's game, you know, some teams play the scrums for penalties. Um, but as far as reaction from the guys and stuff, um, you know, the first couple of years, certainly I came across a few barriers and bumps in the road, but it was just about dealing with it and not getting defensive um, and just, you know, fobbing it off. And, and that, again, was the motivation for me just to go out there. And remember being approached by an older gentleman there. Oh, you're here to ref the thirds. And I'm like, no, I'm actually here to ref the first. He goes, oh, gee, you be able to keep up with the game of play and the speed of play. And I'm like, yeah, I'm sure it'll be fine. And, you know, I go out there and, I, and I, I, my aim then is to do the best I can and obviously prove and maybe educate um, that person and people like him that it's, not, it's just about the job being done. It is no difference or relevance to the gender in the middle. This is the job and to be done on a certain standard. And thankfully, um, you know, um, accuracy and penalties, obviously, it's extremely important. And when players see the referee is, is making accurate calls, you know, it, it, they don't see the gender. They just see a referee, which is wonderful. It's brilliant. Uh, but as you say, there's still a minority, albeit maybe a tiny minority, who still do look at you and think, why is a woman refereeing a men's game? Does that piss you off or do you just realise that you're at a stage in your life where you go, well, I, listen, it's a tiny, tiny minority. The players are accepting of me. The coaches are accepting of this. Everybody is accepting except this 1%. Are you able to move on or is there still times where you get a little bit pissed off at it? 
Not at all. I don't because I don't. I don't like everyone's entitled to their opinion. But if there's an opinion out there that I really don't agree with, you know, let them off. Take no interest. Um, you know, you've heard of a few opinions from Australian players about certain subjects, and and so out there. And you just you just don't take any. Um, you just don't take any notice of it. To be honest, it's, you know, it doesn't bother me. Um, and I certainly won't be looking to be their best friends. So I just get on with it and just do my job. You're probably now at a stage where you're the most high-profile woman involved in the men's game. There's not too many women coaches involved at a senior level in the provinces or around European rugby. What was your reaction then, and I'm sure you were following the trial, when you were reading the about the WhatsApp messages and about the attitudes towards women and the misogynistic tone and the lad culture and the conversations that have been happening around it? Were you shocked by the fallout and what's been going on in recent weeks? Or actually, was a part of you who'd been in that setup for the last couple of years, was there a part of it that realised, yeah, this actually does make sense, that this sort of thing is still there? Look, to be honest, Nathan, I can't really get it, get, get involved in, in, um, on this subject. I, I, I didn't really get into the case either because... Um, I didn't like what I was hearing um, as far as, you know, just didn't like the case from the very beginning. And um, I, I didn't get into the, the ins and outs of it. Um, and, you know, only only they know the, the, the exact truth of what, what went on. And, um, you know, the lads have been have been um, been seen as, as not guilty. And I just, you know, I think in this case, there's there's been no winners at all. And it's just an unfortunate case. And. Um, yeah, that's, what, that's all I'm going to say, really, to be honest with you. Yeah, about that's, that's totally fair enough. One thing that's often said about rugby is that the attitudes and the relationship between players and referees is far better than it is with the other sports, particularly here in Ireland with Gaelic Games and with soccer. And Do you see that? Do you think you could have been a and had the success you've had if you went down, say, the soccer route? Well, do you know what? Hats off, and I often say this, hats off to, to any GA and soccer officials because I know people always say that rugby is a gentleman's sport and I know like different organisations where rugby, rugby, um, uh, Europe, Europe, European rugby and Pro 14, they, they set high standards and player retaliation and that referees, um, you know, address it so that it doesn't uh, spiral out of control mm. and thankfully you know mm. that that you know gentleman sport the title has has remained um you know i i really don't understand um when uh you know players react towards towards referees particularly in in soccer in the professional game when there's when they're getting paid so much money it really frustrates me because for me, when you're when you're an athlete, when you're a professional sports person, you, you know part of your responsibility and role is to lead by example and and teach younger people coming through what way you should act and treat officials. Without officials, there is no game, and um, there should be respect there. And it really bugs me when you see players, you know, shout or curse at referees, um, get in their in their faces, and they get away with it. I think it's very important that the organisations take action in, in preventing those um, those situations and, and you see young kids then coming coming out and playing playing the sports, whatever sports and and reacting the same way and it's just teaching them the wrong um, I suppose the, wrong, the bad standards and wrong standards. Yeah, even as you say, I think something that's probably seen as quite small in soccer, which is shouting in the face of the referee, which they see week in, week out in the Premier League, and it probably doesn't even get you booking half the time at this stage, then leads on to the more extremes of the behaviour, and particularly in the last week or so, and we're still waiting to see what sort of punishment Buffon is going to get for his attack on Michael Oliver, which I think a lot of people are outraged about, and particularly because Michael Oliver, again, like yourself, is such a good example. He was refereeing in the Premier League at 25, the youngest ever referee in the Premier League, and he's got himself to such a high level. And then you still have to put up with this for getting the decision spot on. He was actually right to give the penalty kick, and he was right to send Buffon off for his reaction. It seems to be the lack of leadership above that there was an attitude amongst the, some football people that actually Buffon at 40, he should be entitled to do whatever he wants. Well, do you know what? Hats off to Oliver. I mean, that is not an easy thing to do. And I've always, and we, we've discussed this amongst the, the referee, um, elite referees, and that 
as a referee, you do not want to make any decisions to, to I suppose, um, that would lead to the outcome of the game in the 82nd minute to not only award a penalty, which in my eyes was a, was a right decision, uh, but also to red card a player and a player of that uh, calibre and experience and legend le- legendary title that he has. Like, I'm a massive fan of Buffon and uh, my wife Simona was going mad because she's a massive Juventus <laughs> fan as well and loves him. But... Um, Look, in the end of the day, and 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 I suppose she sees it from a, a referee's eyes now, and she's pr- probably quite protective of me. When I said to her, "How would you like if a player came up behind me and 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 nudged me or pushed me?" and I think he made both correct decisions. I'm very unfortunate that 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 happened to Buffon, and I know emotion, and it was his last, um, I suppose last year before he was retiring, and you know to, to qualify for this, this was it the semi. Um, mm. So look. He has to take responsibility for his actions, unfortunately. It doesn't define him one instance, doesn't define him uh, for a massive, wonderful career that he has. Um, that he has. But I, I think, fairness to the referee, he was spot on. One of the comments afterwards was that he, he's become used to refereeing games. He's been used to using his influence. We often hear that in rugby as well, that a good captain has a good dialogue with the referee, that they're well able to manage the referee. Do you see that as a referee? Do you see captains who like to talk to you a lot, who maybe have a subtle influence or do you have the same attitude to every single player, every single captain? Oh no, you do. You have, you have, you know, Alwyn Jones, um, you have, uh, you know, you've, you've so many experience that's, it's down to experience and being able to knowing the law, you know, knowing the game so well and, it's all part and parcel of the game and hats off to them. And, you know, if they can stretch the referee in his decisions or her decisions in that way, well, fair mm-hmm. play to them because, you know, that's what it's all about, um, getting the win and trying to get the decisions so that it benefits your team. And, yeah, absolutely. And I think that, that you know, the Rory Bess, they're, they're just class players. And I think they know the boundaries. And if they do if they do cross that line, it, it takes, uh, you know, it takes a good referee and a wise referee to put them back in their, their back in their box. And you've seen it happen so many times and, and they, they do know where the line, um, where not to cross that line, you know. So it's, yeah, I, 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 um, I admire it. What's next then? It, it, refereeing, it seems a almost abnormal profession in terms of ambition and where you might want to go and been quite public about that because referees are often well they're at their best as you say sometimes when they're anonymous and they sort of live their lives in the shadows i don't know if the type of thing you can sit here and go i want a referee in a rugby world cup i want a referee a rugby world cup final if if that sort of ambition is appreciated in the industry well, um, you know, I do, you know, I think it's important to always have your goals and, um, you know, as as you p- progress in, in a career, you're, you're, you're obviously, you're, you're the, your goals change. And uh, my, my, my initial goal was to, to referee in, in AIL Division 1A and like that two years ago. And, and to be honest, if you ask me when I first began, whether any of the rest that has, that has come um, since then would have been possible, I said not, I w- truly would have said not a hope. So, um yeah, well, my next goals, I suppose, would be, um, you know, the, the Women's Sevens World Cup is in San Francisco in July and um, the, the, the refereeing squad is to be released in the next week. So I'm hoping to be in contention to be selected for that. I um, uh, would love to be involved in the 26 Nations, uh, men's Six Nations, maybe next year, if that was a possibility or in, in the year after. And the, the, the big the big mile, the big milestone goal for me would be to be on the line for a Six Nations men's game. I've already done two tier um, November's Test Series games, um, one of which was Japan, uh, France, and Japan um, in the new Racing Stadium, which is amazing, by the way. Um, but um, yeah, so I suppose that they're they're the things I'm going to try to inspire to achieve and. And I do whatever I can to, to try to achieve those. And if I don't, uh, you know, if I've enjoyed every single bit of this journey and, and, you know, long may it last. How are you judged as you look to move along those markers? Is it the uh, refereeing authority sets certain markers along the way that you have to hit? Or is it one person's opinion as to who they feel is progressing the best? How do they make those sort of decisions and what sort of influence can you have on them? Well, you have you have members in, on committees from different unions for each of the competitions, and some of them which which would double up, double over, um, double up on on job. But um, I think it's just consistent performances. Like I've done one Pro 14 and two Challenge Cup games now, and it's it's just not about you know the one hit wonder. It's not about you know <laughs> getting through the game, and I think it's it's about maintaining performance and being in contention for further selection and and doing those games and doing them well and. 
you know, the thing with with rugby, particularly, it's such a technical sport. And as a referee, is you come across different scenarios and different games, and it's just, I think, it's for the, for the selectors and those who decide upon your your future is how you respond, and and you know, even when you don't respond in the right way, how you how you bounce back up, you know, because it's it's because you can make the wrong decisions, and it's you know, it's very important you don't dwell on them because you dwell on the last ruck and you and you miss hmm. uh, you miss something in the next one, so. Um, yeah, do you watch, I just do you watch back just, your games the way you would have when you were a player? Pardon? Do you watch back your games the way you would have when you were a player? Oh no, and it's terrible in an awful like it's 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 great and terrible in in the same sentence because I used to watch rugby games and I used to watch the talent and skill of the players and just admire the game. And now I just watch everything about the referee, the way he's communicating. And my my poor wife at home is ready to kill me because I'm stopping rewinding. Shh, one second, I want to hear the referee. <laughs> well, that's what you do as a referee. You think you look at you know you look to learn from the best and. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, I don't look, I don't see the game from from a player's eyes anymore. And I can absolutely, I can um, admire some good play, but it's it's predominantly on the referee. <laughs> and do you look back on the games you've refereed as well? Do you sit down on a Monday morning and go through it in slow motion and listen back? Did you say that sort of clarity that the referee needs to have in their conversation with the players? Do you do all that? Yeah, so like pe- people actually wonder what we do the, <laughs> as, as full time referees, um, and it's a very good question. But it's it is full on. There's six of us full time and, and one part time, and um, so we train we train two to three times a week um, with the strength conditioner in Limerick, and uh, we um, on a Monday we we analyze our games. We have a very um, in depth um, analysis that takes place. You have to break down your own game, and then you have to put it up in a system whereby it's broken down into different areas. Areas, scrum, uh, line out, mall, um, management, high impact decisions, all the, you know, all the aspects. Team of four, and you have to you have to clip your your game, the goods, the the, the work ons, and and the and where where you could you know do better, um, and then you have to you know do do a com- compilation of of every aspect of the game and put it in essay style and, and put it down um, on the system where your PR your your assessor then will come clip his his. Um, I suppose pieces of video that he thinks that could be improved upon, um, and then he 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 pretty much writes the article, and we we look at both and see where we we can go from there. Right. So that will be done, let's say Monday, Tuesday, right. and come Wednesday, thir- come Wednesday, Thursday, you do your research. So if you were refereeing on on the Friday, you'd be looking at both sides at least at their last two games, analysing trying to look at possible trends that you may come across. And then come Thursday, Friday, you're, you're, you're traveling. So we're, we're away. Like, if you think about it, players are away half the time. So they play some of their game, most half their games at home. We don't have any home games. So we're pretty much abroad most weekends. So you would be well aware going into a game who the serial offenders are. And if you've watched back their two previous games, you probably realize they haven't learned their lesson from the first match. You'd have that sort of awareness and a keen eye for certain things that certain players do. Yeah, well, I can only speak for myself. I know a few of the lads will be very similar, and I think it's about having a balance of not going in with the preconception of, yeah, of what you're looking for. From, from, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, and and absolutely, it happened to me before where I did have that preconception, and again, it's something that you you you, you do it, you learn from it, and you kick on. And and since then, thankfully, I've 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 got that balance. But I would certainly be, again because the game is so technical, little things like. If you look at the defence, do they often, you know, would, would they would they not engage in the mall from a line out? In that case, you're prompted to look at was the ball at the front of the mall or is it the back? If it's the back, you know, you have to ask them to break off or else it's obstruction. And if it's at the front, they can carry on. And just it just I think it's just giving yourself an opportunity to to be able to react to these uh, situations rather than them, um, you know, catching you by surprise. Joy, it's been brilliant talking to you. You're over in Tokyo at the Women's Sevens World Series. Enjoy the rest of that, and hopefully we'll talk to you again soon when you're back in Ireland. You're star. Thanks, Nathan. Lovely chatting with you. Hey, hope you enjoyed that latest offering from Off The Ball. If you want to subscribe, and you should, check out just up here. All our latest stuff is just down here. Generally, knock yourself out.